Oh. Oh, I forgot the A yesterday. Okay, so let me, um, let me start today because I still want to get to KKLT. So I wrote uh, some of the equations we discussed yesterday on the board because it saves me a little bit of time. Um, what we discussed yesterday is we derived um, the constraints on the three-form flux in the type 2B theory, um, starting with F3, and we used the supersymmetry constraints Catherine derived in her lecture for M3 on four-folds, so there's a four-form there that satisfies constraints from supersymmetry that also the four-form in F3 satisfies. From there, we were able to derive constraints of the three form in the type 2B theory. And I wrote down the constraints we derived from supersymmetry above. The only non-vanishing component is the to one component, which has to be primitive. The other components of the flux, of the three form flux, have to be equal to zero. If you turn them on, you break supersymmetry. The next thing that we did yesterday is we derived um, a logo theorem. Uh, for the type 2B theory, which states that warped compactifications to Minkowski space give us a trivial, in other words, the warp factor becomes a constant. Um, you get just a Minkowski space, but no fluxes. Um, if you take no sources into account, if you take compact spaces, and we saw that by taking some local sources here into account, so if you put here on the right-hand side some local sources, some uh, sources are available, like orientifold planes or seven brains that uh, wrap supersymmetric four cycles, give ne negative contributions to the right-hand side of this equation so that the no-go theorem can be evaded. What we then have is another equation, so that's so far the Nogo theorem. There's a second equation, which is the Bianchi identity, which tells us how the five-form flux, the self-dual five-form flux, is related to the F3 and the H3 and the charge density. So what we can do is, so let me start the discussion of today. So what I would like to do first today is to see what are the constraints that actually follow from the equations of motion. So right now I told you, okay, there are some components that are allowed by supersymmetry in the first board up there, which, which components are allowed by supersymmetry, but I would like to derive what are the constraints allowed by the equations of motion. So which one of the components are actually solutions to them. So what I can do is to take these two equations here, so I call this equation one, this is equation two. I took one minus two and can derive an equation that I wrote down up there. And from there, I can make my conclusions from what I see from the equations of motion. So very similarly as we had um, for the Nogo theorem, what I see is again, the right hand side is an expression where everything is positive. Left hand side, if I integrate it over a compact manifold, gives me zero. So again, what I can do is to make, uh, to get conclusions from here, um, which uh, tell me what is allowed by the equations of motion. So the right hand side, everything is positive because you can check that local sources, and you can check this say for D3 brains. So local sources satisfy a condition like this. So that I can, can conclude that the last term is also, um, the last term is also positive. So again, we have got specific examples in the book where you um, look at how the three brains look like. So what I can conclude from there is that um, the local sources that are allowed saturate this bound. And again, so the three brains will saturate, so it's like a BPS bound, and the three brains will saturate this BPS bound. So that is condition number one. So what else do I see from that equation? I see that only the components of G3 that are self-dual are allowed by the equations of motion. So G3 has to be self-dual. And now we, it's an easy exercise to check which one of the components of, um, that I wrote down on the first board there are self-dual. So we had, so what we can, so again, so it's something that you can check, it's an exercise. Let me write down the page. So it's an exercise on page 487. And you can check that only the components, so only the, um, so let's see, we wrote down G3 by supersymmetry. What we have is just, the to one component is allowed, 
and all the other components break supersymmetry. Yes, thank you. I keep forgetting the I. Imaginary software, thank you. I don't know why I keep forgetting the I. Okay, and so then we do have a three zero and a one two. So this one's break supersymmetry, the other one is allowed, and only two of these are imaginary self-dual, so only, so you can check. Again, so please check. It's an easy exercise that the only ones, the only components that are imaginary self-dual are the 2-1 component, so only the 2-1 component and the 0-3 uh, component are imaginary self-dual, so these are the only components that are actually allowed by the equations of motion. If you turn on the 0, 3 component, you will break supersymmetry. While the 2, 1 component is allowed by supersymmetry and by the equations of motion. So if you, so that are the constraints that I get. Oh, there's another constraint uh, for the warp factor, but before I do that, so what I see is these are the constraints that I get for the freeform flux in the tab to B theory. There's an additional constraint we derived um, from the supersymmetry constraint that was telling us that the to one component has to be primitive. Again, so it's an exercise that I um, mentioned yesterday. If you're dealing with a space that is simply connected where H10, H10 of the manifold is equal to zero, then any harmonic to one form is going to be primitive. Otherwise, if you're not dealing with a space like this, like T6, then primitivity will pose an additional constraint. So that is um, what we see for the three form flux. What else do we see from the above equation? We see that the warp factor is connected to the factor alpha that we had in the five form flux. So we see, so third thing that we see from this equation is that alpha is related to the warp factor. So these are all the constraints we can see from the equations of motion in the type 2B theory. And again, so there are sources that satisfy, that saturate the above bound, like the D3 brains. So the next thing that I um, wanted to do is to show you how the scalar potential in the type 2B theory looks like because it is a nice exercise in supersymmetry and because it shows us how there's actually a potential for the moduli fields. So why, the moduli, why um, turning on fluxes solves the moduli problem by, by introducing a potential for the moduli fields. So um, let me do that. Um, let's do it here. So the Fermi scalar potential for the type 2B theory looks in the following way. First, the constraints that we derived, that we derived from supersymmetry from F3 can be derived from a superpotential. So there's a superpotential in the four-dimensional theory that is the integral over the six-dimensional manifold omega wedge g. So this is a superpotential. And it's a superpotential for the complex structure moduli fields. So what you see is that it involves the, the, um, the three form, the holomorphic three form. It's a potential for the complex structure moduli fields. There is not something similar for the Keller structure moduli fields. So only a superpotential for the complex structure. So that's number one. What we also know, um, Nati had mentioned it in his lecture, so this is a superpotential, so it is not going to be renormalized in perturbation theory. It's holomorphic, it's holomorphic so there is a non renormalization theorem that tells us that it's not renormalized in perturbation theory. Later on, we will see when I get to KKLT that such a superpotential can be renormalized by non perturbative effects. And this renormalization has been used by KKLT to fix some of the killer moduli, in particular um, the radial modulus. So um, what you can, what I'm not going to do here, and it's a really a nice exercise, 
is to derive from the superpotential that I wrote down there the constraints that I do up on the first blackboard. So here comes another exercise. which goes, use the constraints from supersymmetry. In other words, calculate dA w equal to zero, where this d, where this a indicates um, the dilaton. So I'll, let me put the tau, the dilaton axion, the radial modulus, and all the other. So a denotes my rho, my tau, and all the complex structure moduli fields. This covariant derivative here is simply the ordinary derivative plus d of k, where k is the killer potential, dA of k, and use these three conditions to derive the constraints that we do have for supersymmetry that appear on the first board. So use these constraints, so derive the SUSY constraints. And this is one of the ways in which you can argue there is a superpotential in the four-dimensional theory, or you can go ahead and do a dimensional reduction. By dimensional reduction, you can as well see that there is a superpotential in the four-dimensional theory. So what we know from supersymmetry is that we not only need superpotentials in the four-dimensional theory to get the form of our scalar potential, but we also need killer potentials. And the killer potentials plus the superpotential is going to determine for us the form of the scalar potential. So let me show you how this goes. It's a standard formula in supersymmetry. You can derive, it's again a small exercise in the book, the form of the scalar pot of the killer potentials in the four dimensional theory. Each one of the moduli fields we do have in the lower dimensional theory is going to have its own Keller potential. So let me show you what comes out of there. Again, so that's by dimensional reduction. You will see, you will look at the non-canonical terms for the model, non-canonical kinetic terms for the model fields and from there read off the Keller potentials because what we know is that, let's take the big chalk, what we know is that the metric, so the non-canonical terms, the metric that appears in your Lagrangian will then be derivatives of the Keller potential, and we call the moduli fields phi A, um, phi B, so phi B bar. From there, um, you can determine the Keller potential, and what we get, so again, it's an exercise, and what we get is that the killer potentials in the four dimensional theory for each one of the moduli fields is there's a killer potential for the radial modulus rho. It has got, let me see, I get the factors of i, right? So, um, then there is a killer potential for the axial dilaton. And then there's a killer potential for the complex structure model fields. And as opposed, so that's the total killer potential we get in the four dimensional theory. And as opposed to the superpotential, the killer potential gets renormalized. So there are corrections, alpha prime corrections in the killer potential that some people have used to fix some of the Keller moduli. So what supersymmetry for the supersymmetry tells us is that the scalar potential, so from these ingredients, we can derive the scalar potential in the four dimensional theory. The scalar potential is then a combination of the killer potential, K is the total killer potential for all the moduli fields, multiplied by an expression containing the superpotential. So that's a standard formula in n equal to one supersymmetry, n equal to one d equal to four, Susie. 
So we know um, each of the ingredients in this formula. Let me put this up here. So we know the ingredients in this formula. This GAB that I wrote on, GAB bar that I wrote on there is simply the derivative of the metric, uh, the derivative of the Kenner potential, so the metric on moduli space. So that is the form of the scalar potential in the lower dimensional theory. So there you see the, the superpotential involves the fluxes. How fluxes give us a potential, a scalar potential in the lower dimensional theory. And there are some properties, nice properties from supersymmetry that you can check that this superpotential satisfies. Number one, so again, here's another exercise. Check that the superpotential is invariant under Kähler transformations. So there's an, the, the scalar potential is invariant in the Kähler transformations. Namely, what you can do, so what you can check is that the Kähler potential, so if you transform the Kähler potential in the following way, where the z, z bar denote my moduli fields, Then, if you transform at the same time the superpotential, let me um, continue writing maybe over here. If at the same time you transform the superpotential in a very particular manner, then what you can see is that the scalar potential is invariant under such a transformation as it has to be. So. So what we want to do is we want to transform the superpotential in the following way. And please check that you get invariance. So it's really easy to check that there is an invariance of the scalar potential under such scalar transformations. Another thing that we can check um, from, this particular, from this particular form of the scalar potential is that using the form of this very particular um, Kähler potential, what we can see is that the scalar potential is, is um, not depending on the radial model loss. So a second property is that you can check, so again, it's just inserting in the formula, is that if you do, if you look how the contribution from the radial model loss looks like, um, let's see. So you exactly get zero. So when you take when you take um, the um, radial modulus into account, so in other words, um, the scalar potential is not depending on the radial modulus. Well, that's a problem because you cannot use the scalar potential then to determine the value of the radial modulus. Later on, we will see when we use KKLT that you can take additional effects into account that correct the superpotential in order to obtain the value of the radial modulus. So the scalar potential is invariant. Invariant under, uh, does not depend on this radial modulus. And what we obtain is a potential that is called of no scale type that is positive. So what we see here is that the scalar potential V is um, of no scale type because it doesn't involve the radial modulus and it's a potential that is positive. So it will be a sum over all moduli fields except for the radial modulus. And it's again, so metric 
contracted with DIW, D bar, J bar of W bar, of W bar. So that is um, what we see from the scalar potential. Um, what we see is that from supersymmetry, so from supersymmetry, the minimum of this potential B is determined by D W equal to zero. So this is our constraint from supersymmetry. And from the equations of motion, so that's a solution for um, the vacuum. We see that the cosmological constant is equal to zero um, if we look at the vacuum solution. Yet, in this solutions, in general, there are going, there's going to be, uh, supersymmetry is going to be broken because d rho of w is, um, in general, going to be different than zero. So, SUSY is still broken because d rho of w is generically different from zero which is a rather interesting property because what we see is that we are able maybe to find models in which supersymmetry is broken, yet the cosmological constant is equal to zero. However, we cannot get kind of too excited because this is a property that we only see to leading order in the supergravity approximation, alpha prime corrections, GS corrections, so higher order corrections, may correct the statement so that we cannot claim, ha, we found a solution to the cosmological constant problem. So, so there are going to be alpha prime and GS corrections so that we don't have a solution to the cosmological constant problem. Okay, so that is... Um, so far, um, the discussion I was going to do um, yesterday, what I would like to do, so I will now start the discussion I wanted to do today, and I would like at least to get to KKLT. So I would like to start um, today with a very concrete model that has played an important role in many aspects of string theory, which is the deformed conifold, the Clevano Strassler model that Igor and his friend Matt Strassler um, have constructed for us. So let me show you how that works. It's a concrete model. It is a non-compact model. It's a non-compact model, but all the constraints that we derive from supersymmetry are valid also for non-compact spaces. So you can impose same constraints, the imaginary self-duality constraints. You can derive also from a supersymmetry constraints, and this doesn't require that you deal with compact spaces. So let's take a look at a very simple model, which is the conifold, so the one of Strassler model. So Klevanov and Strasser decided to put fluxes on the conifold. And the nice thing about the conifold, it's a non-compact Calabi-Yau manifold on which everything you know, it's very explicit. So that's very nice because you can check everything we said using concrete formulas. So what is the conifold um, that they used? So what we know is that, again, so the conifold is a non-compact model. So the, let me uh, draw a standard picture for the conifold. It has got the topology of a cone, and it has got a singularity. So it's a singular manifold. Let's see where I get this picture here, right? It's a manifold that has got the topology of a cone. We can, write, we can call this direction. The topology has got an S3 times S2 in the base, and there's a radial modulus. So this is a conifold that is singular at this point here. So this is the conifold. And there are two non-singular cousins of the conifold, which you can obtain by blowing up each one of the spheres here. So there's one that is called the deformed conifold. So let's draw another picture here. That, that you can get by blowing up um, the S3. So let's paint it in this way here. So this is the deformed conifold that Igor considered. And then there's another one that you obtain by blowing up the S2. So we can write it down in this way here. 
So in this way, we can avoid the singularity if we now blow up these two, which is called the resolved conifold. So what we will do is we'll consider the deformed conifold. And again, so the applications have been very, very large of these models. People have considered this in the context of supersymmetry breaking. Um, Shamit, Kachu, and friends have considered this. You can consider it so important. So the first discovery was in the context of supersymmetric gauge theories. So it's the supergravity dual of a confining gauge theory, as Klevanov and Strasser showed. You can see it in the context of geometric transitions that Kumrum Wafa likes to discuss, where you go from one manifold to the other, or in the context of warped compactifications, as we will see a little later. So um, let me show you how um, the supergravity part of the story of the Klevanov Strassler model looks like. So I'm hoping that Igor can explain a little bit more on the gauge theory side of the story when he um, gets to his talk. So I would like to emphasize just the supergravity side of the story, which fits very nicely into the discussion we have had on fluxes. So what is what we would like to do? So let me show you how the concrete formulas for the conifold look like, how explicit we can be. So let me consider first the conifold. So the conifold is to, described by a hypersurface in C4. So this is the conifold. You can describe the conifold as a hypersurface in C4. So I do have four complex coordinates. Let me call them W. And the conifold is described by an equation like this. So this is the conifold. If you're describing the resolved conifold, you will be including an additional parameter. The deformed conifold includes here an additional parameter z, which is the deformation parameter. This deformation parameter is actually a modulus of the theory because you can construct a cone for each value of z. So it's a it turns out to be a complex structure modulus of the theory. So why am I saying, why am I saying, yes? What did I say? Oh, no, no, it's a parenthesis. It's not an absolute value, it's a parenthesis. Say that again? Yes? You want there. Oh, uh, okay. I want par well, it's a complex coordinate, so. Okay, so. Um, so Z is the deformation parameter. And um, so what I see is for each value of Z, in the limit when Z goes to zero, we get the singular conifold. Um, what else do we see? So we see that this um, describes a cone because if WA is a solution, then lambda times WA is also a solution to this equation. So what we do have is complex lines going through the origin. In other words, we do have a cone. And the metric on this cone is known very explicitly. So to get the metric on the base, what I can do is to introduce a new coordinate, rho square, rho square that it's going to be related to the radius, to the radial um, coordinate. And you can compute very explicitly that the metric on the conifold has got um, the following form. So for the conifold, the metric d squared contains the radial coordinate, dr squared. So this radial coordinate is related to the coordinate rho that I introduced a moment ago. r is the radial coordinate. It's a factor. So let me be here very explicit. Rho to the um, to thirds. And then there is a five-dimensional base, which is an einstein sasaki space. And this space has the topology has the topology of S2 times S3. 
And let me write down, even though it is a little bit lengthy, let me show you how the metric on the space, oops, there's a D missing here. Let me show you how the metric on the space looks like so that we can see how explicitly we know um, everything from this theory. Later on, the fluxes are going to be um, determined, so let me push this a little bit up here, um, in terms of um, coordinates from this metric. So let me write down, so there are angular coordinates, so the five-dimensional base is written in terms of angular coordinates. So all, all I'm going to write down now are some angular coordinates that I'm going to need later on to determine the fluxes, um, to write down the, the concrete expression for the fluxes. So again, these are all angles, plus there's a second term here. So from here we can see how explicitly, let me put this a little bit up here, how explicitly we know how to write down the metric for a Calabiya manifold, which is very, very nice because in general you don't have a clue on how to write down metrics for Calabiya manifolds. Okay, so once we do have um, the explicit form of the metric, What's the next thing we want to do? We want to put fluxes on this space. So and what Igor decided to do is he decided to put into the space um, some D3 brains. So he took a stack of D3 brains. So let's paint a picture here. He took a stack of D3 brains. He took N of them, put them at the tip of the cone, and then he decided to wrap some five brains around the S3 of this cone. So let's paint here some stack. So let's wrap here some five brains. And he took M of them, so MD5 brains, that are wrapped on the S3 of the deformed manifold. So what we are going to get is fluxes. So from these brains, we are going to get fluxes. First, from our D5 brains, we are going to get fluxes um, through the S3 of the deformed conifold. And let me call the S3 in a standard notation that I'm going to use later on. Let me call the S3 the A cycle. So there is an A cycle, which is the S3 that goes to zero at the tip of the cone. And there's going to be some three-form flux, Ramon Ramon three-form flux through this um, coming from the D5 brain. And let me take M units of them. I do have M, unit, M5 brains, so that is what we get. And let me write down um, all the fluxes for consistency. We are going to need H3. Recall that G3 is imaginary self-dual. So what I would like to have is a star I G3. So what I need is um, H3 flux. And what I would like to do is to take H3 flux, so it's going to go through the B cycle. Then we call B cycle. The B cycle is S2 times the radial direction. Um, what I get is um, H3. I would like to have minus 4 pi. Um, let me get the factors here right. Alpha prime multiplied by K. And what I know is that there is a five-form flux. So there's a five-form flux coming through the entire base. So it's the S2 times S3. So if I integrate the five-form flux, F5 tilde, what I get is I would like to call this N, 4 pi alpha prime times N. So that is the flux that I do have in my theory. And I can t tell you, so we can now deduce from here, how the explicit form of F3 and all the other fluxes looks like. So in other words, we can determine the explicit form of the solution. 
So let's see how we can do that. Yes. What is K? It's a constant. So these are the integers coming from Dirac quantization condition. Good. So and these constants are going to play in a second um, a rather important role, as you will see when I talk about, when I mention um, the gauge theory, so the dual gauge theory. So um, what I know, first of all, is let's take a look at F3. So what we can show is that the F3 that satisfies this equation takes the form so it can be written in terms of the field binds of the metric that I wrote down a moment ago. So just to show you that how explicitly we know everything here. So E5 is one of the field binds of the metric, which omega 2. Let me call, and I'll tell you in a second what these expressions are. And let me call this omega 3 because I'm going to need this a little bit later. So let me introduce here the notation omega 3. And again, so this E5 that I introduced here, I know this very, very explicitly. So the F5 is just simple expression containing the angles. Or let me not kind of write on everything explicitly, but it contains the angles, so explicit form we have in the book. And again, so the two form, so the two form that I introduced there is again just a wedge product of some of the um, field lines that I do have in my theory. So let me just write down some of the terms. and so on and so forth. So let me not write down the complete expression because it's a little bit lengthy, but the um, entire expression you can find in the book. So again, so we know everything very, very explicitly um, for this flux. What we know is that from um, the self-duality constraint, we need an H3. So self-duality tells us, self-duality of G tells us that we need an H3. So once we know the form of F3, we use self-duality to determine the form of H3. And the H3 that comes out of there is a rather interesting H3, because what we are going to get from there is something containing a log. So which is something very, very important from the perspective of the, of the dual gauge theory. So the, self so the, H the H3 that solves the self-duality constraint takes the following form. So again, we know this by using G3 is equal to star G3 and the explicit form of F3 that I wrote down there. So that is the H3 that comes out of it. Or what I can see since H3 is DB2 related to DB2, what I know is that the B2 goes with a log of R divided by R0, which is an integration constant. So there is something very, very important, it goes with a log of R. So what I know um, from the perspective of the dual gauge theory, since the H3 goes with a log of R, so let me um, erase here. So what I know, so what Igor and friends told us is that the dual gauge theory is an SUN plus M cross SUN gauge, SUN gauge theory. And what this factor of log R does there it's going to give me a running in the coupling constants of the dual gauge theory. In other words, what we're going to be able to do in this theory is to break conformal invariance and get a confining gauge theory. So that's a very important aspect um, of this theory that I hope that Igor is going to be able to emphasize a little bit more. So let me just show you how um, this uh, running appears in the gauge group of the theory, but I'm not going to motivate how the gauge group emerges, how the concrete um, gauge group emerges, and just make the statements. So what you see from there is you get two things. So you get a confining gauge theory, and you get a confining gauge theory which is cascading. In other words, you get a um, bunch of cyber dualities. The gauge group is going to be changing um, depending on how um, the value of R. So what we do have is, so here's just a statement. So the dual gauge theory is an SU N plus M 
Well, this N and M are um, the N and Ms that I introduced a moment ago. I'm going to tell you more a, li a little bit about this N in a second, cross SU and gauge theory. So what I um, will conclude in a second, so let's take a look um, in a second how this N looks like. So we're going to see that this N is effectively going to depend on R. So because the region comes because the H3 depends on R. So we're going to see a logarithmic behavior, and it's going to give us then a confining gauge, a gauge theory whose coupling constants run, which is going to be confining. This gauge group is going to be changing as a function of R, something that, uh, something that has been called cyber duality. So there are cyber dualities in the theory. So how do we see, how do we see that this N of R now is going to be changing? So what we know is that there is um, a Bianchi identity, so we know what the form of H3 and F3 in our theory is. So once we know H3 and F3, we can use the Bianchi identity to tell us what F5 is. And if you recall what I told you at the beginning, if I integrate F5 over the entire base, then I get my n, my effective value of n in this theory. And we will see that this n runs, depends on r, because simply the H3 depends on r. So we know how F3 and H3 in our theory look like. So what we can do is to use now the Bianchi identity, Bianchi identity, which was telling us that the F5, let me put a tilde here, I'm denoting it's the same F5 I had before, the self-dual F5, H3, which F3, whose form I know very explicitly, we just determined it, plus some charges. We know the explicit form of the charges because we know what brains we do have in our theory. And from there, we can determine the form of F5. So again, let me be very, very explicit here. So the form of F5 that comes out of here is, I would like to have an F5 that is self-dual. So let me write it as one plus the 10-dimensional Hodge dual multiplied by an F. And Igor told us the F1 gets out of there. So the F that goes out of there goes with an effective N. That is precisely the N that appears in the gauge group that I wrote down there. Well, let me first get the constants here. So yeah, what you see is that the um, gauge group starts changing. So it's a factor alpha prime square that I still need to get. So we see that the gauge group changes as a function of this R omega two which omega-3 were the omega-2 and omega-3 is uh, what I introduced here on this second board there. So this effective, so this N of R, let me tell you what the effective form of N of R is. This N of R contains the piece that is the constant N, the number of the three brains, but it contains also a logarithmic piece, a logarithmic piece um, which is dependent on the value of R, and which is going to give us um, the running of the um, gauge group. So this is so far regarding the fluxes of the Klevanov and Strasser solution. So again, so we see running of the gauge group. We see that this gives us a confining, um, it gives us a confining gauge theory. And um, what I would like to um, do, so the last thing that I wanted to show you about this model is that we not only know the fluxes, we can determine, we can use these equations here to determine the co complete solution because, so the last thing I need to tell you um, to get the complete solution of this theory is the form of the metric. So we have got the form of the fluxes in our theory so the last thing I need to tell you is the form of the metric. And the metric wants to turn on fluxes in this theory. 
is a deformed conifer. Um, it's a what? So it's a what solution? So what solution? In other words, so the metric contains a warp factor, and we can determine the explicit form of this warp factor. So let me call this warp factor A of R. There is a flat four dimensional metric. Let me put this a little bit down here. So there's a flat four dimensional metric. And then we do have um, the warp factor multiplied by the metric of the conifold. So this is the metric that we had before. And we can determine, so the explicit form of the warp factor um, can be determined once we use the Bianchi identity. So we know how the five form flux looks like. We know that the Bianchi identity relates the five, well, there's a, we know how, well, let me uh, write this on explicitly. So what we know is that there's a Bianchi identity that tells me that there's a relation between F5 and the ages. And we know that F5 is concretely Related. Well, I think I don't need the Bianca identity here. So what I can see is that, let's see whether we need it or not. So what I know is that the F5, whose explicit form we determined from the Bianca identity, there's a relation between F5. So we know the F5 tilde. So from here we know. So we don't need Bianchi. So F5 tilde is equal to the alpha wedge dx1 wedge dx4. And we know how the F5 tilde, the self-dual flux line, looks like. I told you how it looks like. From there, we can determine the explicit form of the warp factor. We know that the warp factor is related, as we derived uh, a while ago. The warp factor is, in the type 2b theory, is related to the parameter alpha, to the function alpha. Um, so let's put here an alpha of y. So once we know the explicit form of alpha that we can read off from the five form flux, we can determine the warp factor. So let me um, show you how this looks like. So that we can see that the solution, so let me not write down here all the constants that we have in front. So what we do have is a GS multiplied by N plus then there are terms that do have our logarithmic behavior. Plus, I think there are some additional terms here that depend on M. So what we can see is that, so the, the beauty of the clever strass model is that we can see everything very, very explicitly, form of fluxes, form of metric, and the bonus is that it's a very interesting uh, theory from the point of view of the dual gauge theory. So that is all I wanted to say um, about the clever strass model. So um, let me see how much, how am I going with time here? So there are two topics that I still would like to show you. And I do have still have an hour. I think I can go for it. So um, there are two more things that I would like to show you is that um, some interesting applications in the type 2b theory is I can generate a hierarchy of scales in the type 2b theory. Again, I'm going to use the conifold that we just discussed, but to show you that I get a nice hierarchy of scales that people um, would like to use to bring phenomena that are at very, that in principle should be at very high energies down to the TeV scale. So say for example, supersymmetry, if you see supersymmetry at a very, very high scale, you can use a warp factor to bring down the energy to the TeV scale. KK modes, black holes, all are things that people are looking for at DLHC, because if you do have a warp factor like this that generates your hierarchies, you might be able to see this in the accelerator. So let me show you how, um, what the motivation is. 
on how you get um, a large hierarchy of scales. Yes. I didn't explain the dual gauge theory. Um, what you can see is that um, this N of R that I wrote on here, this N is the effective, it's the effective. So this N here is the effective N of R. It depends on R, so it's going to be changing. So that's the duality cascade. So I didn't show you explicitly how this gauge group emerges, so maybe Igor can do that. But if you take into account that this is the gauge group, this is the effective end that depends on R, then you see your cascades. So, um, so let me um, motivate for you how um, string theorists got into looking at hierarchy of scales in the type 2 B theory. They got um, excited by looking at the brain world scenarios that some of our phenomenology colleagues, including Randall and Sundrum, looked at. So let me give you um, a short motivation on how um, Randall and Sundrum um, got excited about warp factors in the context of brain world scenarios. By the way, are there other questions before I start here? Yes. Uh, is I was asking myself the same question. So, is there a simple explanation of this? So, how you can see that it's an integer? This n depends on r. So, how do you see it's an integer? So it goes in steps. So you tune it so it, it starts being integer. That's the point? Uh, right, right. It goes in steps in reality. Well, that's a very good point. So while I was preparing this, I was asking myself exactly the same question. Yes. So good, very good point. Say that again louder. Yes. Very good. OK, so. Um, Yes. More questions. How do you see confinement in terms of brain Igor, I, I, don't, I, I didn't explain the dual gauge theory. How do you see confinement? Well, it's a logarithmic behavior of the coupling constants. I, I'll, I'll try to, on Monday, I'll say a few words about it. So, basically, the work depends on the property of the coupling constants. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Okay, so let's reserve that discussion then for money. Very good. Okay, so I won't have time um, to get into um, concrete discussion how the gauge theory looks like. So let me show you um, how, so the original, a simple time model of how um, brain world scenarios look like. So what we do have, um, what I would like to imagine is, so again, in brain world scenarios, it's a simple motivation of how um, how we can use hierarchies of scales um, to bring down energy values and the values of um, the energy. So what Rundle and Sundram were imagining is that um, what we do have is um, our world is a four-dimensional plane embedded in a five-dimensional space. So let me call the additional coordinate x5. And I would like to take, they had several scenarios, but let me take um, the scenario where they do have two brains. One of them is called the Planck brain, which is located at x5 equal to zero. And we live on the standard model brain. So here's where we are sitting. It's called the standard model brain. Let me call the distance between the brains R. 
And the standard model brain, let's take it for concreteness, x5 equal to pi times r. Now it turns out you can write down how the action of this theory looks like. So let's write down how the action of this theory looks like, and we can determine a solution to the equations of motion of the action that I'm going to write down. This is going to contain a solution with a warp factor that is going to have interesting properties. So the action that we do have is, well, we do have five-dimensional theory containing an Einstein term. And then we need to take into account, uh, let's put a cosmological constant. It's going to be the Sitter space, if you would like to um, find a solution to the equations of motion. Then we do have the action for the brains, which is the tangent of the standard model brain. And then we do have the same thing, so let me put here a minus, and then we do have tangent of the Planck brain, again, d4 of x. And let's put here a standard model brain, and let's put here a minus g of the Planck brain. And you can write down how the equations of motion of this theory look like. And a solution of these equations of motion, um, as Ronald and Sunil determined for us, is given by a metric that contains a warp factor. And you can determine that in order to find a solution, so this A is our warp factor that has got a very explicit form in order to solve the equations of motion. So the equations of motion are going to be telling us that A of x5 um, is equal to square root of minus lambda. So from there you see that you have to use anti deciduous space in order to find a solution. And there is a relation between, well, let me write it down, there's a relation between the tangents of the brain in our theory. So what we see is that um, in our solution, the Planck brain is situated at x5 equal to 0. And if we set, if you look at this metric here, x5, setting x5 equal to 0 means that the metric that we see on the Planck brain is a flat metric. We can look how the metric on the standard model brain looks like. We said that the standard model brain is at x5 equal to pi times r. So the standard model metric is not going to be flat, but it's going to contain the warp factor. So it's going to contain the factor e to the minus pi to pi r square root of lambda eta mu nu. Yes? It's, no, it can be infinitely extended. can be infinitely extended. That's no problem whatsoever to get four-dimensional gravity because the warp factor is sitting there. Good. So are there any other questions? OK, so, um, so that's a very so interesting fact that while one of the metrics is flat, the other one is actually not flat because what we can do is then energies that are very, at very, very high scale at the Planck scale, say, we can bring them down using the fact um, that we do have so that the metric contains um, a warp factor. And again, so phenomena that we thought are at extremely high energies, we can bring them down um, to the TeV scale. So let me write down how the energy scales just um, for completeness. So energies will then contain, so if you write down how energy is taking this factor of the metric into account, so if you look at energies on the Planck brain, so phenomena on the Planck brain that occur at energy E, so it will happen on the standard model brain at energies containing the warp factor, so minus pi times r square root of minus lambda times e. 
And now you can use, so this is the standard model brain. So the energy on the standard model brain. And now you can use, tune the distance between both brains to reduce the energy um, on the standard model brain to an energy scale that you would like to have, say, the TV scale, which is, again, something rather exciting because you may be able to observe some phenomena that are actually Planck scale phenomena or high energy scale phenomena and, um, at the TV scale. So um, I do have 15 minutes left. So let me show you how we can implement, implement such a scenario in the deformed conifold, in the deformed conifold that I do uh, type 2B theory. And then I would like to finish with some remarks um, about KKLT. So are there any questions on this? Yes. If you try to generate hierarchies like this, at the end you are fine tuning the distance. What's the difference by, uh, I don't know, if you want to solve the hierarchy problem with this kind of uh, scenario, what's the difference by fine tuning the distance or fine tuning the control term? OK, so I think in string theory the answer is, more interesting because in string theory, what you will see is that there are integers. So the hierarchy is given by integers instead of tuning, okay. instead of tuning a constant parameter, which makes it interesting. So to come to the next point in the discussion, where we embed the scenario in string theory. But that's a very good point. Are there more questions? Okay. So then, let me um, try to embed the scenario. Um, we just discussed into type to be string theory and use what I've discussed about the deformed conifold um, to do this. So, So again, we would like to um, take the deformed conifold. We know how the potential in this theory looks like, the superpotential in our theory looks like. And we know that, so again, so let's take a look at hierarchies in the deformed conifold. Let's put again the KS model. So what we know for the KS model is that we would like to take flux going through the A cycle, as I had mentioned before. We would like to take M units of flux. And I would like to have K units of flux going through the B cycle. So that is what we know for the KS solution. And we know how the type to be superpotential looks like. Um, I'm going to use in the following some brief, uh, some, a couple of things that we need from special geometry that I'm not going to be able to explain in detail. But we do have a short, short section in the book explaining special geometry. So there you can read um, some of the ingredients that I'm going to use in the following. So it's something very, very simple that you may want to learn in order to be able to describe the moduli space of vacuum string theory. So what we know is that the type to be um, superpotential, we have been discussing the gukov waffer witten superpotential, uh, some people call it W is equal to integral G3 wedge omega. So what I can do is we know that G3 is related to the F3 and the H3. So let me remind you again. So G3 is equal to F3 minus tau H3. And what we can do is to insert this form of J3 into the superpotential and to use Poincaré duality. Poincaré duality, which tells us that we can write, so again, some elements on special geometry that you have to, that I won't be able to go through. But the final result is that you can write the type to be superpotential as an integral 
of the holomorphic freeform over a B cycle minus k times tau integral of the holomorphic freeform over an A cycle. So this integrals um, of the holomorphic freeform over an E and a B cycle is what's called the periods of the holomorphic freeform. So these are called the periods. And you can use this period to define coordinates on your model space of aqua. So let me show you how this works. So we can use the A period, the A period of omega, to define a coordinate z on the moduli space of aqua. And then there is a dual coordinate that is related to z. So I'm just going to So we can use now elements in special geometry to um, introduce a coordinate on, in the modular space of aqua. So that's a pretty standard formula. So it's the integral a cycle of omega. And Catherine motivated this. So if you remember how Catherine explained this, she had a very simple example. She used the toros. And she showed you how you can use determine the um, holomorphic three, well, you can determine the two form shade in that case very explicitly and how you can obtain the radius complex structure very, very explicitly in terms of the periods. So um, um, what we have is then I can introduce a coordinate z, again z equal, uh, going to zero defines my singularity. And I can have dual coordinates. I can introduce dual coordinates which are defined in terms of integrals of the holomorphic three form over the B period. And those dual coordinates are going to be functions of Z, the coordinate um, that I get from the A cycles. So once I know, um, so again, so these are standard formulas I didn't show you this formula so you can read details about this in the book. And it's a very short section, so I encourage you to read this. So once we know how the spheres look like, and we know that the periods are in the superpotential that I do have on the second board there, I can easily determine <coughs> the a derivative of, that the derivative of the superpotential with respect to my coordinate z, is equal to, so let me not write down the constants here in front, is equal to, so there are some constants here in front, then there is an m divided by 2 pi i multiplied by log of z minus i ks divided by gs. So these are the leading terms. I would like to assume that k divided by gs is large. So these are the leading terms in the derivative of the superpotential. So if I would like to, so supersymmetry tells us, or if you would like to find a vacuum solution, we would like to set this equal to zero. And from there, we can determine how the z coordinate behaves. And the amazing thing is that the z coordinate is related in the um, solution we are considering is related to the warp factor. So let me write down how this explicitly looks like. So, well, let me write down the z here. So what we get, if we solve dzw equal to zero, from there we can determine that the z goes in an exponential manner. So let me just put here, I didn't take the factors in front into account. It goes as an exponential of minus 2 pi k divided by m times gs. So what you see from here is that the coordinate z goes exactly in the same way as we had in the brain world scenarios. We had a coordinate r describing the distance between the brains. Here we see that our coordinate z goes in a similar way with an exponential. By tuning now uh, integers, so now comes the point where we do have integers, k and m, we can define, we can obtain a large hierarchy of scales. 
And the interesting point is that the Z, if you remember how the concrete Klevanov stressor solution looks like, the Z is directly related to the Ward factor. So e to the A is related to Z to the one third. And if it's related to the word factor, so we see that again, the word factor has got such an exponential behavior, which will allow us to bring energies, again, high energy phenomena down to low energy phenomena. So that is all um, I wanted to tell you about embedding large hierarchy of scales into string theory. So are there any questions on this before I go for my last topic, which is some remarks about KKLT? Okay, so I don't see any questions, so let me, in the last couple of minutes I have, tell you um, some elements of KKLT, which show you some of the power brain physics has in string theory. So what you see is we started our lectures discussing, well, type 2B theory is something rather uninteresting because there are no Gauss theorems. You get n equal to two supersymmetry in d equal to four, so a theory that is not interesting at all for phenomenology. If you put in brains, you start being able to avoid the no Gauss theorem. And what I would like to show you now is that um, how we can avoid the no Gauss theorem very explicitly by obtaining the sitter space and how some of the problems we were discussing before, concretely the problem when we said, well, in type 2B theory, we only have a complex structure, a superpotential for the complex structure moduli. The radial modulus, the scalar potential doesn't depend on the radial modulus. So how are we going to fix this radial modulus? We can add corrections to the superpotential. Well, the superpotential, you know there's a non-renormalization theorem. So if the superpotential which tells us that there are no perturbative corrections to the superpotential. So if you would like to correct the superpotential, it's got to come from non-perturbative effects. So let's, so that's the basic idea of KKLT. And again, so what we are going to be using it for is to generate the sitter spaces from type 2B3 and to uh, fix the radial modulus, so rho which is a killer modulus. Okay, so let me so start. And I'm going to follow um, the original discussion of KKLT. So the original discussion of KKLT assumed that there is just one radial modulus, there is the complex, so there are no other Kähler moduli, and there is the complex structure moduli, and there is the action dilaton point. So just one Kähler modulus. And there has been some criticism in the literature saying, well, in order to get instant effects from the radial modulus that I'm going to introduce in a moment, you need particular conditions on the internal, topological conditions on the internal manifold in order to obtain the instant ones. And some people have written papers saying it's hard to find such conditions for manifolds where you do have just one Kähler modulus. So I'm going to follow the simple discussion they had at the beginning. Later on, people have written papers where you can generalize and where they claim they're able to satisfy the conditions. But let me just take, for simplicity, tell you the idea using the simple toy model, which contains just one killer model. Of, and again, so we have to take it with a grain of salt because there are some, um, some things we kind of need to be careful about, topological conditions that I'm not going to be um, too careful about now. So what I would like to do is to take type 2B theory, type 2B theory, I would like to take, again, the superpotential that by now we know very well. And let me call this W0. And I would like to take corrections so that entire superpotential is then given by W0, corrections that are allowed by um, supersymmetry non-normalization theorems, because what I would like to take is non-perturbative effects, which are exponentials. 
where my rho is the radial model loss. So again, I'm taking a model with one killer model loss, complex structure modula, modulae are arbitrary, so they're encoded in the superpotential here, and there is the dilaton, so the dilaton axion, which is contained in this G3. So this A, large A, and little a, are um, in general going to be functions that depend on what type of instanton effects I'm taking into account. So from where can I get instanton effects? I can get instanton effects from the three brains. So I can get instanton, so let me um, write down, let me call this here W instanton. And I can have different sources for instanton effects in the type 2B theory. So what I can do is I can take three brains wrapping four cycles. So in that case, so let's take your three brains on sigma four. And you can see then that the A, so let me call this A of Z, so it's going to depend on the complex structure model E. And there's going to be an exponential factor, the particular constants in this case, so it looks in the following way. So this A depends on the complex structure model E, and the way KKLT proceeded, again, that's something some people have criticized, is to assume complex structure model E are fixed at this point. This A is then just a constant, so assume that this is a constant. And the only problem that we're, so, and it's fixed through the superpotential that I wrote down there, the W0. And now my only problem is to fix the radial model loss. So the question is whether some people have questioned whether this is legal to do or whether you have to kind of assume all the model fields are arbitrary and try to fix them all at the same time. So that's one of the points people have criticized, which I'm not going to address. So what we have got is, so instantons coming from there, assume complex structure model fields are fixed. Then we can have seven brains. So we can have seven brains wrapping sigma four, and we can have gluina condensation on the seven brains. So gluina condensation are going to give you, are going to give you um, contributions that are of this exponential type. So what we can do then is, so I need, um, so I'm five minutes over, so I need a couple of minutes more, and then I can finish. So um, what we can do is to take now this exponential into account and to look again how the minima of our potential look like. And what I would like to do is, um, I do have the radial modulus right now, I would like to fix the value of the radial modulus in a supersymmetric manner. So, um, what I would like to do is I take the entire superpotential, which contains W0, and it contains my radial model loss, and I would like to um, look for the minima of this potential, supersymmetric solutions the, um, of this potential, and look for the minimum of this potential. So, what I do have, um, so again, so this is a constraint that follows from supersymmetry. It's a concern that follows from supersymmetry, and again, we know that the scalar potential in the type 2B theory is my e to the k, so the potential we discussed earlier in this lecture, which was, which canceled out in the case where we just have W0, but now I'm taking non-perturbative corrections into account. And you can look um, how the minima of this potential, which are supersymmetric, look like. So let me set, um, let me introduce the, let me follow KKLT and introduce the notation where I neglect the axion and I'm just taking the imaginary part of rho. So the potential, let me draw a picture, has a supersymmetric ADS minimum. So they were interested in looking for supersymmetric solutions so that it's easier to find minima of the potential and they have got the situation better under control. So the, super the scalar potential, sorry, that they get um, in this case is an ADS scalar potential. It has got a minimum that is negative. Let me just draw it in this way here. So this is sigma. 
So it's the super potential, uh, the scalar potential as a function of sigma. It contains a minimum at sigma zero. Let me call this minimum V zero. And the concrete value, well, let me write it down just for completeness. So the concrete value of V zero, which was determined by KKLT, was minus I squared. So it's a function of the constants we have in our theory divided by six sigma zero multiplied by e to the minus 2a sigma zero. But again, sigma zero is the minimum of the potential. So what we see is that the scalar potential at the minimum is negative. It's a, it's a desider, supersymmetric desider vacuum. So the next thing that KKLT, so the final thing that KKLT did is to, did I say desider? I meant anti-desider. So it's lambda less than zero, lambda less than zero, it's an AES solution. And the last thing that KKLT then did is to break supersymmetry. They added D3 brain, D3 bar brains to the solution. So, and you can explicitly calculate how the contributions of D3 bar brains to this potential looks like. And it's going to lift, to lift the potential to a positive value, the three bra brains preserve a different supersymmetry, so the potential is going to have a minimum. The potential will have a minimum that breaks supersymmetry and produces then accordingly a positive cosmological constant. So once you add the three bar brains to this theory, it gives you an additional contribution that KKLT computed for us. So we take the original potential that I wrote down over there, and then the three bar brains. So I would like to add the three bar brains to my theory. Then what we get is an additional contribution to the potential, which goes like d. So let me not take the constants divided by sigma three. Sigma three is sigma is the imaginary sigma cubed. Sigma is the imaginary part of rho. D is the number of, is related to the number of D3 bar brains. And if you now um, plot down, so you write down how, you paint a picture on how the potential looks like. So what you see is that you get a nice vacuum with a positive cosmological constant. A vacuum that is metastable because what we see is the following. So it's a vacuum that contains a minimum here, um, but there is a potential barrier here. <coughs> KKLT um, computed for us the lifetime of such vacuum. They argued the lifetime is very, very long. So it's a metastable, it's a good metastable uh, minimum. So that's kind of the illustrates the power brains have in physics. So we started this lecture saying how uninteresting the type 2b theory was many years ago, how interesting it is that we can generate now solutions that do have rather interesting properties like the sitter space. Again, we have to take this simple example that I discussed with a grain of salt, try to implement this in string theory, getting more killer model -y, but I won't have time to discuss this, so I would like to stop my lectures here.